Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title and topic, how foreign countries paid up $8 million to Trump. Uh, specifically, we're talking about how foreign countries over the course of his presidency um, enriched Donald Trump. Gifts, uh, paying rents in excess of what the market would bear. Uh, countries specifically like China, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Um, Donald Trump was enriched by being president. Although he gave up his salary of, I think it's 250000 a year, uh, he made millions of dollars by foreign countries and, and not foreign countries. So to discuss that, I have with me my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. Happy 2024. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Tim. Welcome. Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you too. Uh, Jay, you know, the Chinese government, the embassy, um, Chinese banks, uh, they all stayed at Donald Trump's properties. Uh, one property was the Trump International in Washington, D.C., Trump International in Las Vegas, uh, Trump Tower in New York near the United Nations building, and of course, then there's Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue. But uh, all these foreign countries occupied his his space, his uh, his hotels, and paid great sums of money to to occupy. Uh, certainly, I think more above and beyond what the market would bear. Um, would that constitute, in your opinion, a gift? Yeah, I don't think there's any question about it. But we don't have any guidance from the Supreme Court on it. And uh, that's regrettable. By the way, let me add that of the uh, $7.8 million that Jamie Raskin and the Oversight Committee in the House found, um, five point, I think it was 5.5 of it came from China, which is interesting because China is an adversary. Um, and it's really important that we control the amount of gifts and money that are coming in from um, other nations, especially autocracies, especially adversaries. The other thing I want to mention <clears throat> is that this, this $8 million was over a period of only two years, uh, 2017 to 2019. Um, because the committee was unable to obtain information from Azure's Trump's, Trump's uh, you know, accounting firm uh, for beyond outside that period. And when Comer became the chair of the committee, he immediately stopped the flow of information from Azure's, um, which means the committee only had limited uh, data to draw its conclusions to conclude that it was $7.8 million. It, is probably much more, more countries, more periods of time, um, more, more. Um, only they, they could only find 7.8 because they were stopped. You know, in my introduction, I was negligent not to mention that in the United States Constitution, in Article 1, uh, there is this, what is called the Emollients Clause, in which basically says no president shall accept gifts of any value from foreign entities. Uh, so if you're if you're John Q. Public, uh, is the is the response well well so what every president has done this since uh, George Washington, but that's not the case. Um, what what why should we be concerned about Donald Trump receiving gratuities gifts uh, versus the so what factor? Not every president. I mean that Correct, that's a, you're right. We're we're lulled into that, but we we were lulled into a. Um, you know, a mode of uh, assuming everybody is corrupt, but that's not true. Uh, Abraham Lincoln received two tusks from a country in Africa worth a lot of money. It was ivory. And he went to Congress and he asked Congress if he could accept these as emoluments. And Congress said no. Um, and I think they're in the Smithsonian now. Um, you know, so, the, you know, the, the, the problem is that people over the Trump years have gotten used to his lies They've gotten used to his corruption, and so they don't see this as uh, anything significant. But it is significant because, pursuant to your question, because it compromises the United States. A uh, chief executive is taking money without saying anything uh, from a foreign government, um, including governments that we are at odds with, um, and we don't know about it. And he is making his decisions based on being compromised. 
Uh, furthermore, those countries feel that he owes them something. So their you know, diplomatic position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States is entirely different. It's not arm's length. Um, and so what we have is a, a secret corruption on an international scale, and it's wrong. And that's why the Founding Fathers put it in there. Well, that's interesting. They did put it in there, but uh, yet we have Supreme Court um, Justice Clarence Thomas, who took a lot of gifts and it doesn't seem to apply. The Constitution doesn't seem to apply to the one who interprets the Constitution. Um, well, that's this. We should talk also about Section Three of the Fourteenth yeah, well, Amendment. He is directly <laughs> relevant to that, and uh, he, he he probably won't recuse himself. So, uh, if you want to have confidence, you want to believe in the Supreme Court. It's very hard to do it these days. Yeah, uh, Chuck. Why do you think the founding fathers made a point to prohibit the president of the United States from receiving foreign gifts? Um, remember at that time, we were very concerned about how uh, foreign entities may try to um, start another war with the United States. In fact, 1812 was just that war. But uh, why do you think the, the founding fathers felt that was important? You know, I, I think another way of looking at this, I think Jay has just really pretty much answered that question. But another way of looking at it that amplifies Jay's answer is if you look at it from the perspective of <clears throat> what power alliances you're building in order to control decision-making, <clears throat> whether you call them bribes or corruption or whatever, doesn't matter. What they were concerned about is the development of factions that could erode the ability of the majority to govern without interference, without risk, without being prevented from accomplishing the objectives of that governance. And that's exactly what's at stake here. In other words, the trade-off is not just corruption and bribes. The trade-off is the establishment of relationships that allow decision-making to be done not only in secret and adverse to the best interests of the collective, but to prevent the majority and the democratic orientation, not party, but democratic system orientation from being able to exercise any influence or power or authority at all. So it's essentially a power shift mechanism. That's the problem. And let me add one thing to that, Chuck. Um, is, you know, the notion is that the president is the sole channel for diplomacy. He controls the State Department. Uh, he controls communications with other countries and so forth. And that's why it is illegal for, for example, a member of Congress or a, a private civilian um, to go out into the diplomatic world and conduct negotiations on behalf of the United States. We can't have that kind of fragmentation. We have to know who's responsible, who's doing it, and we have to know that person is not corrupted. And that person is the president. It's, um, it's got to be um, carefully managed. It's got to be pristine. And this is part of all that. So Chuck, you know, the Supreme Court in January 2021 basically did not take the case on, they dismissed it. Um, do you think that this emollients clause will, will come up as a future issue for future presidents, it hasn't affected the Biden administration. Uh, do you think it rears his ugly head again, uh, spe specifically if Donald Trump were to gain the uh, president's office again? Uh, what might that look like? You know, I think it's a great question because it, it goes to the political strategies. The strategies of the MAGA GOP identify with certain issues. Some people call them talking points, but they're not. They're, they're social justice issues. And those issues, they will exploit, they will disinform, they will distract, they will use any of the deceit mechanisms and the power shifting mechanisms that they can influence with the support and participation, not just the acquiescence, the support of the media to do that. So again, we're looking at power shifting here. And it's ironic that 
It's being done not by relationship building, like Lincoln did in building alliances to enable the U.S. to get by slavery and to actually have sufficient alliances to protect just enough of the democratic institutions to make slavery illegal, at least on its face. That now we have people who instead, whose strategy is to divide and break down rights. We have a Supreme Court whose strategy is to take away rights. If you're trying to use your religion as an excuse to discriminate against people who would be constitutionally and legally protected against that discrimination, this Supreme Court says, yeah, go right ahead. If you're a football coach and you want to get your Christians out there on the field and kind of pressure them into joining the group and engaging in prayer, go for it. If you want to deny people website or wedding cake access because they're gay or whatever, go right ahead with that. But where does that stop? If the power shifting is based on dividing rights for the oppressed from the rights of the oppressors and only enforcing the rights of the oppressors against the oppressed, you have no rule of law. And we have none. We have zero nada. If you were looking for a country to live in, in which the rule of law had a chance to survive, this would not be on that list at all. Okay, thanks, Chuck. Uh, Jay, That's you the know, optimistic view. Jay, um, in addition to the Constitution, uh, the Emoluments Clause, there is a 1966 um, federal law called the Foreign Gifts and Decoration Act, which... Um, no one is supposed to accept a gift in excess of $415. Now, I'm sure that was $1966, uh, which who knows what that would be a valued in 2020, 2020 or 2023 or whatever. But um, Donald Trump received a lot of gifts directly from uh, golf clubs, from um, Prime Minister uh, Abe of Japan, uh, a 2018 World Cup soccer ball by, yes, guess who? Vladimir Putin, um, a falcon head, gold-plated ancient Egyptian god head of Horus from the uh, Egyptian president. And not to be outdone, $6,400 of, of gifts from the Saudis. Um, it was a, a, a jewelry collar. And uh, there's a picture of Donald Trump receiving it from the Saudis. Not just uh, payments from his hotels, but direct gifts in direct violation of the Emollients Clause. Um, as we used to say uh, some time ago, que pasa? Why, why, um, no, why in no, your opinion, no. you think these gifts were ignored? Oh, and by the way, they're still missing. Uh, they're looking for those gifts. And I don't know if any of them are still lurking around uh, Mar-a-Lago, but uh, what should we say about the direct gifts that he, he received? Check the bathrooms first. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. You must have read my mind. It's behind the shower curtain. It's all there. <clears throat> you know, if, if you're trying to, uh, you know, insinuate, Tim, uh, that Trump has been corrupt all the way along, um, you've done a great job. But it's not a surprise. You know, he, he has been corrupt in his real estate practice. He's been corrupt in everything he's dealt with. And he's manipulated the people around him and the courts around him. He is, he is a picture of corruption. So it would be, it would have been amazing had he reported these things. He wouldn't, he didn't, he won't, and he established a precedent for future presidents. And the Supreme Court has established a precedent for future presidents. We now have corruption built right into our DNA, thanks to all of them. And the news just came out moments ago that to clarify things for everybody and make it absolutely crystal clear exactly what's going on here. Donald J. Trump has just this very moment applied for a middle name change. He will now be Donald I. Trump or DIT, Donald Immune Trump. Well, there it is. There's the transition I was looking for to leave this topic because I think we've uh, discussed it enough and transition over to the immunity defense that uh, Donald Trump's lawyers yesterday in front of uh, three federal, were they judges? I think they were judges. 
yeah. and uh, argued that Donald Trump is immune from all criminal or civil prosecution as president of the United States, and he could do no wrong and cannot be prosecuted after he leaves office. Uh, gentlemen, I, I, I had to do a nasty plunge uh, after I saw how the attorney was arguing that. Uh, to the credit of one of the judges, uh, stating specifically that if the president of the United States were to hire a member of SEAL Team 6 and assassinate one of his political enemies, would that be okay? Not to give you the answer or spoil the show here, but Chuck, to you, uh, how do you, how do you want to uh, summarize Trump's attorney's response? He said, if you can't impeach him, you can't get him criminally. And of course, because as long as you don't have two thirds of the Senate, you can't impeach, right? Impeachment is not a criminal proceeding. It doesn't have criminal evidentiary standards. It doesn't have criminal proof standards. It bears no relation to a criminal proceeding at all. To connect and condition criminal exposure on impeachment has absolutely no basis in law at all. But okay, well, this is around Robin. Um, the Department of Justice put out a memo saying you can't crimi uh, criminally uh, prosecute a sitting president. Yet, when, when the president leaves that office, uh, you can't prosecute because of immunity. So there's, uh, isn't that just kind of a, a daisy chain of, of bad logic? Well, the first one is wrong in the first place, right? Because if a sitting president is doing a press conference and somebody stands up, probably likely a non-white Asian woman reporter, and asks a question he doesn't like, and he assassinates her before the entire audience. Hey, can he be immune from that because he's in office and because of that DOJ memo? Hell no. Well, according to his attorneys, the answer is uh, definitively yes. Well, of course, because they don't have the word no in their vocabulary for that question. So it doesn't matter what the question is. They only have two answers to everything. And if it is, yes, Trump is immune, it's a yes. If it's a is Trump not immune? It's a no. It's okay, a pretty take they're one trick ponies, just like he is. They only have one trick. They lie, bully, cheat, steal, and make sure that you exercise life as a zero sum proposition. You can only get at the expense of others. Your gain is their loss and their loss therefore is your gain. That's the way life and works. And yet he leads in the polls. Okay, Jay, your take. This is all politicized. This is all in face of the election coming up. Um, if you if you make him immune, uh, all these proceedings stop dead in their tracks. Um, and, uh, um, you know, if you do that, that certainly helps them on the election, doesn't it? Um, on the other hand, uh, I'm remembering the first part of our discussion today, the emoluments clause. What uh, the Supreme Court did on two of the three cases before it it said, well, we're going to just hold up on that, um, you know, until uh, Trump, it's too early. We're going to hold up on that until Trump is no longer president. And then they made their decision after Trump was out of office. And when he was out of office, they said, oh, this is moot. It's too late. I love when they do that. I love when they do that. <clears throat> and so there is another uh, option here, Chuck. They could just sit on it uh, and they could wait on the immunity question until after the election, assuming Trump wins, then he can instruct the DOJ at the very least um, to stop the prosecutions, the federal prosecutions. I'm not sure how that affects the state prosecutions. It probably doesn't. But as president, he will have a lot of ways to, to stop those prosecutions. We know that he intimidates people. He has this uh, stochastic rhetoric, uh, these, these political backroom threats. So if he's president, he'll be able to stop it. Therefore, um, the middle, the middle ground, or at least the clever ground for them, uh, is to not rule on it until after he's president. The other possibility, Chuck, <clears throat> is that um, they could redefine what immunity means. I mean, after all, we live in a world where language doesn't mean what you thought it meant your whole life. Um, the word insurrection, for example, has taken on a, a whole new, a whole new, uh, uh, you know, meaning, and and so has the word office holder to take on people you know make it up and so they could make up a whole new uh 
panoply of 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 of, of the definitions um, of of the word immunity. They could say, well, he's not immune if he shoots the reporter. He's not immune if if he shoots somebody on Fifth Avenue. But for this other category of things, he is immune. I mean, one of the things that was raised in court yesterday was suppose he instructs a SEAL Team Five uh, to go out and assassinate a political rival. Um, you know, may, maybe that I don't know which side that would fall on. All I'm saying is there's another possibility, and that is to redefine the term. They could they could do both, and the easiest way to do both: defer it, send it somewhere else, and redefine it is to give him what has been given many government officials called qualified immunity. That turns upon whether the official has a reasonable belief that they were acting within the course and scope of their authority at the time. It, it doesn't turn on whether they were or were not. It turns on whether they had a reasonable belief that they were. They could redefine it, give him qualified immunity, send it back, for further factual determinations. And they could craft the language to make it very, very difficult for the lower court to not find that he had qualified immunity. Take something which is not dependent on intention and make it intentional. And, and just to drive the notion of see enter, um, you know, mindfulness uh, into the definition. And then you have a difficult trial a uh, question of fact where you don't know how it comes out. Nobody knows what that means. And so you have essentially gutted the term. Well, what's you know, interesting there is you present a really, really interesting mental competence question. And that is, can a devout narcissist have a reasonable belief? I don't think so. I think a psychiatrist would have to tell you they're not capable of forming a reasonable belief because their only belief is the self-ordered structure that's based on deceit at the very root of it. Does that in effect support the idea that he has total immunity? No, it's the opposite because he can't form a reasonable belief so he can't have a reasonable belief. Yeah. You know, we should oh, be you guys are talking that. about bringing psychiatrists into a courtroom uh, on the question of immunity, uh, that that can go anywhere and everywhere. That's about as amorphous. You know, for every expert psychiatrist, uh, you can find five experts who will say something different. There is it, it, there's no there there, and so you have this question of fact that is essentially unresolvable and uh, subject to all kinds of argument and opinion, um, and it never it never comes home to roost. But it does go up for appeal, legally, but not politically. Politically, if you put the issue of Trump's psychiatric condition in front of the populace before the election, you might actually make a difference because that's the one area where he's most vulnerable. And yeah, you're gonna get psychiatrists on both sides, but you're going to put that issue in front of people that his psychiatric condition is relevant to his ability to govern instead of the political. Well, Chuck, what I hear you saying is uh, we expect our presidents before they become presidents to undergo a battery of physical, uh, medical uh, tests to see if they're capable of, of, you know, serving their four years or eight years. Uh, what's wrong with the idea of a battery of psychological tests more than the ability to count sheep or <laughs> count backwards? Why should a person who is psychiatrically subject to a disorder, not just a trait, but a disorder, why should they be qualified to hold office That's if the disorder point. is not effectively treated? That's my point. Thank you. Institutionally, uh, put him in know, for 72 hours and examine him. I mean, it seems like every dictator that's ever come to power in any country seems to suffer from narcissism and um, psychosis. Um, not necessarily in that order. I put to you that a that, and that is exactly why neither Chuck nor I are ever going to run for president. Yeah, right. <laughs> we don't All pretend right. to be psychiatric. That's true. You don't. <laughs> you don't. I thank you, Chuck. 
for bringing that to the forefront. You don't tip, pretend to be. Okay, so Jay, you sound surprised <clears throat> when um, attorneys or courts or judges seem to take the plain English uh, language and, <clears throat> and twist it into something that's not. But why should you be surprised that in the first week of Donald Trump's administration, there was an individual, I think it was a communication strategist, Kellyanne Conway, that took the, the term alternative facts that meant that anything goes because just because it's a fact doesn't mean there's it's not a it, it is a fact that there could be alternative lies that we now call alternative facts. Um, we seem to be surprised by that, but that's what's taking place, is it not? Yes, I was surprised when she developed uh, the notion of alternative facts, <clears throat> and I have been surprised ever since that that in large part the media buys into it. They say, oh, okay, well, that's just another point of view. Well, when she said that, we ought to, we should have screamed. The entire media should have screamed. And when there are lies going on, it's, it's more than just reporting the 30,000 lies. It's a matter of calling him out. It's the most important thing on the block. What we, we have inculcated the notion of lying into government. And we have politicized lies. We have weaponized lies. And we can't survive as a democracy if we do that. So um, yes, the answer is we, you know, we have we have tolerated lies, we have to tolerated outrageous claims, and um, we shouldn't. Yeah, we're right. normalizing lies. We're normalizing it. Thank you, Chuck. Um, that is correct. Or we're being desensitized to the avalanche of the number of lies that we can't process. Uh, in Donald Trump's case, I believe it's over 30,000 30, recorded lies during his four years. And to your point, Chuck, it was only 30,000 because he only served four years. Th that goes to just something that is sort of nibbling at the edge of our discussion. And that is, if he gets away with this uh, immunity, crazy throw it on the wall immunity claim, um, and if he gets away with, um, you know, not being... Um, disqualified under Section 3 of Article 14, he is going to be operating under a mandate, and there will be no nobody, nothing to stop him. He will eviscerate government. He will eviscerate anybody who's who opposes him, any rival. It will be, you know, uh, autocracy. And in that case, what, you know, what, what I see is the 30,000 lies will seem small. Everything will be a lie, and everything will be corruption. You know, Jay, we're running out of time, and I just want one last thought from you. Um, after the after the hearing yesterday, Donald Trump got in front of the you know the media, and basically said, um, "It's going to be bedlam. It will be bedlam in this country if if the courts decide against him." Uh, there we go again, the word bedlam in this case, which means uh, madness or chaos. And certainly uh, the the implication or the implied uh, meaning of bedlam. And as it we've talked about before, uh, stochastic speech, uh, speech that implies there's going to be violence if things don't go Donald Trump's way. Your thoughts? Well, we were talking before the show about uh, the comparison of bedlam and Farrandon in French where the inmates were running the asylum. <clears throat> and, you know, if the, if the person on the street knew more about the history of Bedlam, and for that matter, Sharon, then, uh, that person would not be so sympathetic uh, to a situation where the inmates would be running the asylum. However, to the average person on the street, Bedlam means violence and chaos and craziness. Um, and it is stochastic speech. He is calling for violence. He has done that on a regular basis. And, you know, I'd like to say there ought to be a law. And sadly, we, we may only find out the need for a law after, you know, his stochastic speech works. But, um, you know, he and uh, Lindsey Graham have said, and others have said, um, that if it doesn't go Trump's way, um, you know, there will be violence on the streets. And, and that means Second Amendment violence. Because the people, you know, who are on their side of the, the playing field are the ones that have the guns. And so we will have mm, violence and, and guns uh, on the streets. 
So <clears throat> this is very, very scary. And, um, you know, I, I, if I had been Tanya Chutkin, I, I would have made a, a, a gag order much stronger than this. Um, but what are you going to do? We still have the First Amendment, and he still does this, and he understands it better than we do. But there's no question, uh, as on January 6th, that he is calling for violence. Yeah, I believe the quote was, um, be there, it will be wild. And they did show up, and it was, as predicted. Uh, Chuck, your thoughts about um, Donald Trump's word choice uh, after the hearing yesterday, saying that if the decision doesn't go his way, it will be bedlam. You know, I think you got to remember Sharon Dunn as well, because what Trump is talking about is not just insane chaos, of which he's the leader and he, he feels completely comfortable, but he is the inmate running that asylum. So it's both bedlam and Sharon Dunn in which he's the leader of the inmates running the asylum and they're hand-picked inmates and they are insane. They are not morally grounded. They are violent. They're, they're criminal, as is he. That's the, right. It's not just an ins asylum. It's a criminal asylum of uncured people. So when I talk about putting his psychiatric condition under the microscope, I'm talking about exactly what you just brought up. You know, one of the things I like about uh, Think Tech Hawaii is um, there's no ambiguity here. Um, just none at all. And with that, we've run out of time. I'd like to thank my esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, for attending today. And of course, always, my co-host, Jay Fidel. Why don't you join us next week? And also, if you like this show, and if you thought it had some worthwhile moments, which I hope you did, uh, why don't you follow us and click like? We really appreciate it. And until next week, aloha.